only people who saw Arnold as the winner, seven judges and his closest friends. None of the audience, or very few, only those that were his friends. Mincer was one of the participants in the 1980 edition of Mr. Olympia. He was the Mr. Olympia champion in over 200 categories in 1979, where he was placed second overall behind Frank Zane. Mincer was a famed bodybuilder for two reasons. He was the first person ever to receive a perfect 300 from the judges in an IFBB, Mr. Universe Contest 1978. And he was one of the biggest critics of Schwarzenegger's 1980 Mr. Olympia win. Today we delve deep into this infamous controversy. Mike speaks up. During an interview, Micah said, I get sick and tired of hearing people bring up the idea that, well, bodybuilding is subjective, so who are you to say that contests are fixed? That is not true. Anything that exists in reality can be viewed and judged objectively. There are objective criteria for judging bodybuilders. He added, It was interesting at the 1980 Olympia. The only people who saw Arnold as the winner were the seven judges and his closest friends. Menser also mentioned Yates's win a few weeks before the interview, where all the judges, competitors, and the audience thought he should win, furthering his point on objectivity. A guy named Greg Zulak, who has a bug up his butt about Mike Menser and his mustache, <laughs> saw that Dorian Yates was the winner. There are objective criteria without a doubt. Bodybuilding is not subjective. One is very, very close. You might, of course, haggle over one guy having a little bit more size versus the other guy having a little bit more definition, but those are still objective criteria. There is no way Arnold Schwarzenegger deserved to win in 1980, not even close, explained Menser. Well, on that particular day in 1980, he took a distant backseat to Arnold. Arnold seemed to be running things. He could have it any way he wanted. A competition full of disputes. One would think a surprise return and the shocking win from Schwarzenegger were all that disrupted the event, but they'd be wrong. There was more going on than these two incidents that scarred the year's events. On the morning of the contest, 15 of the 16 participants signed a petition to abolish the weight classes and conduct the competition as one open weight class. The only athlete to not sign the petition was Schwarzenegger. Athletes questioned him about his thoughts on why there should be two classes, but Mike and Arnold had more than an exchange of words. Schwarzenegger took a shot at Menser's 1979 second place finish, which got to Mike. Menser bolted towards him and started berating him before he was pulled out by others. Schwarzenegger ultimately withdrew his objection. The reactions were mixed. Competitor Mike Menser was furious and even tried to attack Arnold at a pre-contest press conference. Other athletes like Frank Zane and Boyer Co. expressed pity that Arnold was going to return, lose, and tarnish his legacy. On the night of the show, many were shocked at Arnold's conditioning. The Austrian Oak failed to compare to a new generation of stars. When Arnold was announced the winner, the audience booed. Competitors stepped off stage and some retired from the sport in disgust. Fans and competitors were equally outraged. Television networks separated from the competition. New rules regarding judging were set in place. Arnold's 1980 victory isn't just controversial, it changed the trajectory and perception of bodybuilding forever. While Menser and Schwarzenegger became good friends over time, Mike remained firm on his opinion until he passed away in 2001. That particular contest was so clearly fixed that every other competitor and many of the fans in the audience raised a fuss. After the Austrian Oak. When Arnold retired from bodybuilding in 1975, it ushered in a new age for the sport. Arnold had won the previous six competitions. His retirement meant that others could now compete for the Mr. Olympia title. Taking over Arnold's place was his training partner and close friend, the late Franco Colombo, who won the 1976 Olympia. From 1977 to 79, Frank Zane took the honors. Although two men shared the title over four years, the time after Arnold's victory was competitive. With Arnold out of the way, newer bodybuilders began to gain attention. Competitors like Boyer Co., Mike Menser, and a young Tom Platz. There was excitement in the sport. Arnold had previously been the athlete with the most sponsorships and magazine covers who monopolized all the media attention. Now, fans could choose from a variety of different athletes and body types. If Arnold represented the ideal physique of the 1960s and 70s, these newer athletes were progressing the standard of bodybuilding further. Illustrative of this were the careers of Frank Zane and Mike Menser. Zane's reign, for example, marked a stark difference from Arnold's era. Compared to Arnold's approximate competition weight of 235 pounds, Zane weighed 185 pounds on stage. He was smaller but also much leaner. His physique, by many, is considered to be the most aesthetic ever. Challenging Zane at that time was Mike Menser, one of bodybuilding's most controversial characters. Menser was known for going against the grain at the time, whereas many bodybuilders opted for two-hour-long training sessions with high volume per body part. Menser trained using the high-intensity training principles of Arthur Jones. 
he'd perform just three exercises per body part, working up to just one or two sets for each exercise to absolute failure. As for his diet, Menser was a proponent of calorie and macro counting before diets like if it fits your macros were a fad. He'd eat protein-rich meals, but also consume treats like ice cream and pancakes, even close to a competition. In 1978, Menser won the Mr. Universe contest with a perfect score, the first time this happened in bodybuilding history. In the 1979 Mr. Olympia, he finished in second place to Frank Zane. When Zane, Menser, Chris Dickerson, Boyer Co. and Tom Platts traveled to Australia in 1980 to compete in that year's Mr. Olympia contest, few individuals could predict a winner. None could have predicted Arnold's entry and the rest is history. The reason behind Arnold's return from retirement came from his movie career, specifically his role in Conan the Barbarian, released in 1982. Starring in Conan required Arnold to transform his body from a lean young warrior of about 215 pounds to a full-bodied, robust king of about 230 pounds. Arnold set to training and began using his old bodybuilding routines to build a Conan body. Somewhere along the way, his training partners encouraged him to enter the Olympia, and so he did. Schwarzenegger vs. Menser We're certain we're all familiar with multi-Olympia title holder Arnold Schwarzenegger's training style. He was known for his traditional, high-volume approach that was heavily popularized in Joe Weider's publications. It wasn't uncommon for Arnold to be in the gym for hours at a time and sometimes twice a day. Contrast that to the late IFBB pro Mike Menser's heavy-duty training system. Mike was a strong contender for the Olympia title and was admired for his rugged physique. I keep my distance from those people. Uh, I even rarely talk to Joe these days. Conversations are my associations. But he promoted a very abbreviated but high-intensity workout. Menser balked at Schwarzenegger's marathon workouts and claimed that only one set per body part was enough for growth and that doing additional sets was actually counterproductive. As you can tell, there's quite a stark difference in volume. The differences of training styles came to a head at the 1980 Mr. Olympia contest. Who can forget the iconic picture of an angry Menser standing and pointing his finger at Arnold who sat in a chair, legs crossed as cool as a cucumber? Both athletes were supremely confident in their approaches to muscle building. Who was correct? We would have to say both training styles are effective, but individuals who benefit greatly and consistently from Menser's high-intensity methods are few and far between. Charles Poliquin has suggested that athletes can only benefit from a heavy-duty program if they are severely overtrained from a previous high-volume routine and those small benefits derived are short-lived. We would suggest that those who can continually grow from this abbreviated workout are the genetic elite and they are extremely rare. All the NABA people, all the IFBB people know this and nobody's willing to talk about it. See all this immorality going on. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.